Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum at Cadence Independent Media. It is the holiday season, the gift giving season, and we wanted to do a little bit of a chat about what to look for buying a new snare drum, whether you've already got one or if you're getting another one for your collection. There are a lot of factors when you're looking at a drum that can influence how it's going to sound, how long it's going to last, whether or not it's going to get the sound that you want. And so we were just kind of chatting earlier about sort of like a buyer's guide. If you're going out to buy, you know, your first snare drum, like if you're getting a snare like for your kid or something like that, or if you're just adding one to your collection, if you're the player. Over the years, I've bought some snare drums that didn't work because I didn't look at everything. And I've, I've even had some that got worse over time and I had to replace parts and things like that because of little bits of information that I didn't know. In hopes of like kind of staving off some of those things, we're just going to kind of go down a little bit of a list for when you're adding things to your collection or maybe if you've got something that you're considering getting rid of because there's something about it that's not working for you. First things first, and I've seen this a million times, is you're in a drum shop, somebody walks up, they see a drum, they go, oh, I've always been meaning to buy an Acrolyte or whatever it is. They set it on a stand, they hit it, and they go, oh, that drum sounds terrible, and they walk away. That's bananas. The heads and the tuning and everything can ruin a amazing drum. I mean, I've played friends like Craviatos that sounded real bad because they weren't maintained well, you know? And the fact of the matter is that sometimes the drum has something wrong with it, but nine times out of 10, the heads are shot, especially if it's used, but even some stock heads are not like super high quality. There are Remos that are not made here and there are, you know, there's a lot of different levels of things. So when you're going to look at a drum, the A number one thing is don't just set it on a stand and hit it and say, that's the sound of that drum because it's not. And as an anecdote, I, this, I personally did this in a store. I saw a guy do that. He was looking for a Superphonic. He walked away. I tuned the one he had just played, and I said, hey, man, I found another one. And he came over, hit it, and bought it. He actually asked me if I worked there, and I was like, no, I don't work here. You have to go talk to that guy. But he bought the one that he immediately before that was like, it sounds like trash. I just tuned it. So when you go in, think about the type of drum you want, and play with it a little bit. Try tuning it. If you've seen, you know, any of our videos, we're pretty heavy on the tuning and tone <laughs> side of the spectrum. So also, like, if the heads look like they're shot, don't read the character of the drum based on blasted heads. So when you set out on your trip to the drum shop, there's sort of like two places that you're probably going to be. You're either headed to get a certain thing, or you're going to see what they have and maybe stumble upon something that's cool. Lots of times you'll hear a recording or you'll read an article and think, oh man, I love the sound of that drum on this recording. I wanna go find that drum. On the other hand, most of the times that I've ended up buying a drum, I wasn't actually going there to buy anything. I just stumbled on something and I played it a little bit, maybe took it in one of like the small rooms away from everybody and played it a lot of different ways and tuned it differently. Sometimes like changed the battered head if, if they'll let me. Um, before I end up spending money on it, you know, and this doesn't just go for expensive drums like $200 is a lot of money, you know, $1,000 for a snare drum is a lot, lot of money, but it's an investment either way with a great $200 snare drum or a mediocre $1,000 snare drum. These are all things that are investments and they will last forever if you take care of them. So when you're going in with a certain kind of sound in mind and you're thinking, I need to go buy a bell brass because that's the thing that I'm looking for or something like that. At least then, you sort of got a plan. But the heads and the tuning and the production of that recording you heard probably have more to do with it than the drum does. And so when you're thinking about a certain kind of drum, to me, I think it's more about thinking about a certain kind of sound. Like if you're thinking, I need a superphonic because of, you know, Steve Gadd in the 70s. What you really need is a superphonic-like drum. And there are lots of those. You might find a Tama that nails it, or you might end up buying a real one, a new one, a vintage one, you know, whatever. A classic example of this scenario in my life is that uh, I have always wanted a Black Beauty, and I don't have one. We have a video about them. I had to borrow one. But I do have a nickel over brass snare drum, and there are lots of affordable ones, especially if having it be seamless isn't fundamentally necessary to you. And sound-wise, it's a different sound, but it's not that different. Um, you know, there's Pearl Sensitones, uh, there's the Tama, um, Kenny Aronoff snare. There are a lot of things like that. I have a Drum Paradise 
nickel over brass that I bought from a guy in a practice space in New York for like 150 bucks. And it makes that sound enough for me. And that to me means that like, if you know how to just kind of get the drum to behave and sound the way it wants to sound, you maybe don't have to spend all that money to get a good enough sound in that direction that you're after. All right, let's talk about the variables of the drum itself. The things to check just sort of in no particular order are the state of the hoops, the state of the bearing edges, the mechanism, the snare beds more for sound than for construction. Like hopefully you're not going to find a drum with like misaligned snare beds. And then obviously the heads that are on it. Now, when I'm going in to look at a drum that I'm thinking that I might buy, or if I, maybe I'm just coming to help a friend with a drum. Uh, the very first thing to check before any of the rest of that stuff is to figure out if the drum is round or not. It's pretty quickly apparent if it is or not, because in my experience, drums that are out of round, they won't make a note no matter where you tune them. They will have a weird sort of glarpy sound in the middle. And you'll even find situations where no matter how you tune it, there'll be wrinkles in one spot, like even when you're cranking it down, because there just can't be equalized tension in a circle. So if that's the case, just, I mean, walk away. <laughs> there's, there's nothing to do there. Um, and it's not worth getting into trying to get it fixed unless it's like a really special vintage drum. And even then, like you're going to spend a bunch of money trying to get it back to where it should be. So let's start with the idea that the drum is in round because everything else on there can be replaced. I want to look at the bearing edge on the bottom of the drum and make sure that there isn't any damage. But, you know, you can see through most snare heads. They are more or less transparent. You usually can't see through the batter heads on snare drums because they're coated most of the time. So... I will take the batter head off pretty much every time because especially with triple flange hoops, it is possible to strike the bearing edge with a stick. With a metal drum, it's less of an issue. With wooden drums, it's a huge issue, especially if it's used. I mean, if it's brand new in the store, this is probably not that big of a deal and I don't really do it with that, but I mostly buy used drums. And if the bearing edge on the batter side is super chewed up, you may have tuning issues, it can be fixed, but again, that's more money to have it sanded and redone and all that stuff, and that can get expensive. Taking the head off and getting a look at that edge and then putting the head back on, you know, the one that's on there, and tuning it from scratch. Even if it's fairly banged up, you can start from scratch and get an idea of the behavior of the drum. Most shops, if the head is really chowed and looks like the moon, they'll change it because they're not going to be able to sell that drum. But, you know, I've, I've gotten into arguments with people and used shops before when I start taking the drum apart. They think I'm taking it apart, which is insane because you have to change your heads. But anyway, uh, checking that edge is crucial because if you can't tune it, you can't really use it. Uh, thing number two is the hoops. Hoops are replaceable, but it'd be nice if you didn't have to. So looking at the hoop, maybe looking at it from the edge of the drum to see if it's bent, looking at it from the top to see if it's in round, which if the drum is in round, you can see like if there's a crazy gap at the edge between the drum and the hoop, or if it's like pulled off the side of the head off of the, off the edge, or something like that. They're not the most obvious thing really, especially if you hit the drum and it sounds pretty good, you know, but that's an issue that can become a bigger problem later um, for both sides. So checking the hoops, also making sure that they're not cracked. There are some hoops that you'll find there'll be cracks underneath the screws. Um, in my experience, it's been brass hoops, like vintage brass hoops that are pretty thin that have just been bent from tension over and over again until they kind of crack. Um, and again, that's also not a thing that you can really fix in a permanent way on the hoop. I mean, maybe you can weld it or something like that. I'm not really sure, but Hoops, triple flange hoops are a pretty inexpensive investment. So if one of the hoops is screwed up, but the drum is happening, you can just get a new hoop. Part number three, the snare mechanism. Now, there are a lot of used drums where the mechanism has been replaced with either something more modern, if maybe the old one was damaged or just not working right, or if somebody just went crazy and re-drilled it for like, you know, a nickel strainer or something like that because they wanted to, because they wanted something smoother. If it's been re-drilled, for different holes, it may affect the value of the drum if you want to resell it again, or if they're trying to hit you for the full price, you can kind of prod them about that and be like, this isn't supposed to be on here. But the more important thing is just does it work or not, regardless of what's on there. If it's not functioning, if there's something broken on it, if this action is screwed up, 
Or, you know, if you hit it with like four or five rim shots and the wires get loose like right away, there's probably something screwy about the mechanism. Also replaceable, there's lots of different aftermarket ones. The same goes for the butt plate side. I'm a big fan of drumfactorydirect.com for this stuff because they have name brand stuff and also house brand stuff. And they uh, always publish the widths of the screws so you can get it to match exactly to your shell. One thing that does happen sometimes with these mechanisms is you'll see damage underneath on like thinner metal shelled snare drums where somebody dropped the drum on the mechanism and it's bent in. Um, much like a car, like a body shop, like that can get pounded out if it's necessary, if it's a really special drum. Um, that's not the worst thing in the world, but it can um, cause the wires to be a little bit misaligned and maybe behave strangely, but not, not the worst thing ever, and that's that, that can be um, taken care of. With wooden drums, if they've been re-drilled, you can get the holes filled by a builder or something like that and sanded and, and fixed up and things like that if you if you really want to go that route. Um, it's all about basically like how much money you want to spend, how much space in your brain you want to spend on that drum. The one thing that I often see kind of messed up in drums when I'm shopping for used stuff and also sometimes new ones is just the state of the wires. You can replace wires inexpensively. Uh, if you're in a shop and you found a drum that's the one you're looking for and the wires are bent or shaky or rattling, um, it's worth asking them like, hey, can you throw in a new set of wires? Because again, like plain old chrome, like Gibraltars or whatever, very inexpensive. If you're going to buy a $200, $300, $400 drum, it's not unreasonable to be like, can I walk out of here with wires that work? You know, can you put them on? I think that most shops care about their customers. And I think that most of them want you to leave happy with the thing you got and the sound that you're making. And, you know, likewise, or like something Ben was saying earlier is maybe if you know the head that you want, on your drum and the head that's on the drum that you're thinking like if this might be the one buy the head that you want at the shop for whatever 14 18 bucks change it before you buy the drum tune it up and then if it's not working take the head go home put it on another drum because it's not stretched out yet it's only been on there for five minutes and if it does work then you got a drum with a brand new head and you can walk out with that if people in the shop are being fussy about that you know that that might happen but at the end of the day, again, like it is an investment. And if it's the one year after, you might have it for the rest of your life. So there's no sense not really kind of working out all of the variables that you can think of. Uh, just a side note on new drums also, unless it's marked as a demo or a floor model or something like that, or like lightly used without box, which they say on the internet sometimes, it's sort of incumbent on the store to make sure that you're happy with that drum because it's supposed to be new. And if it's been out, if it's been hit at all, if the wires are screwed up, uh, you, you need to be walking out with the equivalent of a new drum if they're saying that it's new. So if the hoop is screwed up or something like that, you know, bug them about it and be like, you know, this is supposed to be new. You know, you want my money and I want this drum, but I, I want it to be new because that's what you're calling it. One little side note about the sort of vintage drum side of this conversation is that um, I will buy vintage drums sometimes that are missing parts if the shell is totally intact and groovy. Um, because there's a pretty huge market for replacements, either modern reproductions or actual ones. Um, for instance, I have, uh, from way back in the calf skin video, I have a modern chrome over brass superphonic that I got a vintage throw for from the 60s because the modern one, frankly, was like stamped out of sheet metal and it made a lot of noise and I didn't like it. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with a couple of places that, you know, have parts knocking around here in Brooklyn and like um, Don Bennett's shop out in Seattle. And so I just asked them, like, do the screw holes line up with an old like P83 or whatever? And they're like, oh, yeah, they're exactly the same. So I just got one and put it on there. And then I was happy ever after. Uh, and likewise, uh, when I got my Acrolyte, it didn't have the baseball bat muffler and I managed to find one of those. Um, they, they just gave it to me. They didn't want it. It was in a pile of parts. And so now it's all original again. And sometimes those drums, because they've got holes in them with nothing on it, they'll go for even cheaper because the guy selling it is like, I don't know what's supposed to be there, but clearly it's not fully intact. So, you know, shave 50 bucks off or something like that. So that's something to think about too. If you saw our previous video where we were sort of starting to talk about snare beds and the way they behave and those sorts of factors, it's worth noting that familiarizing yourself with the sort of snare beds maybe that you like or that drive with the wires that you like it will help your choices when you buy other drums like 
I know some people that are pretty attached to like 42 strand wires. I know some people who are super into narrow wires. And if that's a sort of baseline thing that you tend to do with all your drums, unless you're doing like a real outlier kind of sound, uh, that can influence your purchases and influence even like brand preferences or era preferences even of, of vintage drums so that you don't have to go all the way through the experimental process again. Like if you know you like a certain kind of wires that work on like 60s or 70s Ludwigs, you can use that when you're looking at other stuff and be like, well, I probably shouldn't buy the drum that has the weird, deep, narrow wires because I'm going to have to figure it out again instead of just putting it together and be good to go. Last word on snare beds. Uh, do check the snare beds if it's a wood snare and make sure that there isn't any damage from metal cords being used to hold the wires on. Um, this was a conversation we've had a bunch of times and a few people have chimed in. Uh, that have had their drums damaged, at the very least had their snare side heads damaged because they used braided metal wire on there thinking that it would be stronger than like nylon or, or straps or something like that. And the tension combined with the friction of it crossing the bed actually cut into the drum like deeply, uh, which is horrible and really hard to fix. And basically you can't really have your old snare bed ever again unless they like fill it with putty or something and it seems just like a nightmare so if you're looking at wood drums definitely look for that because that's something that apparently happens a lot i haven't had it happen but i've also never used metal on there before um but yeah that would be a super bummer to find after you spend a bunch of money on a drum it's like finding a crack in a cymbal after you get home from buying it you know it's not good also a word on heavy metal snare drums not like heavy metal but like heavy metal snare drums is uh, taking into account that they are not fun to schlep around. And uh, if you live somewhere where maybe you take the subway a lot or you live like half a mile from the train, as awesome as those drums are, uh, you might find yourself not using them much. And they also tend to be kind of pricey, um, which is something that I have discovered in my life. <laughs> and uh, I use... Uh, lightweight drums and f and get a good sound out of them pretty commonly and then I save those ones for studio sessions and so on the flip side like if you're like someplace where you always drive to the gig and do the van thing and all that stuff you know use whatever you want um, but that I, I didn't think that through and <laughs> I've been thinning the collection a little bit because of because of that so just to sort of sum up uh, kind of the bottom line with all of this is do your research both beforehand uh, with the sort of sound you're looking for, the sort of drum that you're looking for. If you're going for a vintage thing, understand what parts are supposed to be on it so you know if it's been tampered with at all. And then when you're there, do on the ground research. Make sure that the edges are okay, make sure that the hoops are okay. Really like fuss with the strainer, make sure that it's working, that there isn't anything loose or weird. Um, check the snare beds, make sure that they haven't been damaged at all. And uh, don't be afraid to take the heads off at the store because if they don't want you to do that then take your business elsewhere because that's not fair to you to make sure that you're getting the thing that you think you are this dovetails directly into making sure that if you're going to do uh really big purchases or even really small ones uh buy local shop local support your local shops instead of buying stuff online if you can help it because not only are you supporting a small business and supporting the drum community where you are, wherever that is, um, but you can also actually find out this information instead of just looking at pictures and crossing your fingers. Um, I haven't bought a drum online in a really long time um, because I, I had one that showed up that was like, oh man, I mean, I can't do anything about it. It's sold as is. I spent the money and now I have this thing that doesn't work that I can't really even resell. So, you know, that's, that's worth taking into account. And uh, it, it's, it's a community building exercise too. You know, take your friends to the shop, make it a hang and make sure that we still have drum shops. All right, as usual, please like, comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you're going out to get a new drum this season, let us know what you're getting or if you're getting rid of something or what you're looking for. And uh, yeah, have fun with it.